Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments. Today, we are gonna be going over an article that first premiered on the Boss Rush Network. Now, full disclosure, I didn't even know this particular website existed until people started contacting me via email, via Facebook, telling me that there's an excellent article on this particular website that I need to do a video on. And I actually took the time, I read this particular article, and I agree, this article is definitely worth commenting on. For all those of you unaware, the particular link to this article is going to be in the video description below. The article is entitled, Collecting Retro Video Games is a Waste of My Money. And the article was published by a person by the name of Stoy Jovic. Um, if you do watch this video, Stoy, if it gets to you somehow, you hit the nail on the proverbial head and did a fantastic job with this article. As a fellow author, as a fellow published author, I salute you. So we are going to go through this article. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to give you my analysis and assessment. With that being said, because again, we are going to be talking about one of those collecting categories that people seem to love and have a strong emotional attachment to. If anything in this video triggers you, guess what? It's supposed to. This is a collectibles finance channel. I'm not here to hold your hand as we walk down memory lane and reminisce over Pikachus or Planeswalkers or Marios or Sonic the Hedgehogs or vintage Star Wars or whatever it is, guys. I am here to set the record straight over how the antiques and collectibles trade operates over the short term and also over the long term. With that being said, we're going to get right into this spectacular article. I caught myself staring at my wall of video games recently. It's a vast collection of over 1,300 video games spanning multiple generations. Nintendo, PlayStation, Sega Genesis, Game Boy, up to the current generation PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. They sit on shelves, displayed out like you're inside a GameStop. After a few minutes, I asked myself, why the hell do I have all this? Collecting old, antique items isn't anything new, and in some cases, it can be a beneficial financial investment. That's 100% true. It's what we talk about day in, day out on this particular YouTube channel. Tangible investments like toys, stamps, coins, and in this case, video games can appreciate in value in many different ways. These particular investments have a connection with our childhood and what we were raised around. I've mentioned in a previous editorial about how nostalgia has an effect on our psyche and latches on to memories in our past, which can affect how we live in the present. Guys, I have done a whole other video solely on nostalgia and how it is nothing but a lie. A lot of you guys don't seem to realize the more time, effort, and money you put into items, things, people, situations in your past, it's taking away from your present and your future. If you learn one thing out of anything I teach on this channel, understand opportunity cost and the time value of money. I assure you, you cannot spend your present, you cannot spend going forward living in the past. Otherwise, you are going to be going in reverse. And that is going to have dire consequences, not only on yourself financially, but also mentally and emotionally. The past is a great place to visit. Don't get me wrong, for short bursts of time. But even myself, somebody who is very much in love with history, somebody who is very much in love with collectibles and antiques, I would not want to live there. You need to understand that. A lot of the emotional attachments that a lot of you guys have to this stuff is nothing but a chemical reaction in your brain because you experienced it before at an earlier time and you want to reconnect with that time frame because something either happened to you that was either traumatizing or on the other end of the spectrum, extremely positive. Okay? This is something that you got to really look into. The psychology of collecting, the psychology of why we fathom or we pursue a lot of these objects from the past. Always remember, guys, a collector is born. They are not made. You cannot convince somebody who is not a collector, who doesn't have that particular drive to become a collector over the long term. They may engage in it over the short term, but they're not going to stick with it through the years. And that's why there's a lot of wealthy people out there that have a lot of money, 
They have no desire to own vintage comic books or rare coins or high-end pieces of art. To them, it's considered to be redundant. They're minimalist. They just would rather have their money sitting in brokerage accounts and the like. With that being said, before I go any further in this article, I have to say, yes, it is true. If you understand how the markets and the antiques and collectibles trade operate, they can be a great way to diversify assets. If you are putting all of your money as an investment in any of these markets, though, you are doing it 100% wrong. And it is going to slap you in the face like a stale donut at some point in time if it hasn't already. Let's go back to the article. For many, collecting antique physical items harkens back to the good old days, not only with how things were made, but how we experienced them. Isn't that 100% true? I continued to look at my collection as I pondered, eventually throwing my hands in the air. This does nothing for me. This was all a waste of money. Now, this is where I got to bring up my criticism towards the author of this piece. And this is only my only one criticism. I often wonder if he is a true collector because most collectors don't have that revelation. Most collectors would be like, you know, I put all this money into this. I'm really not getting anything out of it. Let's sell it, move on. Let's go into something else. That's how most collectors think. Very few collectors that I know have ever walked into their room of collectibles, antiques, whatever it is, and said, you know, I don't even know why I bought all this stuff. That's really not a hardcore true collector at that point. So that's my only criticism of the author. Everything else is spot on, but I just have that inkling that he may not be a true collector. And maybe I'm 100% wrong on that. And again, the author of this piece is named Joy jo Stojovic. If that's incorrect, if that's a false assumption about you, I apologize 100%, but that's my only criticism in this whole piece. Going back to the article, the reason why I say this is that often with collecting, I purchase items that I remember having or have experienced when I was younger. Those feelings of nostalgia are ones that I never want to go away. Like the memories of an ex-partner, remembering those good times we shared. I display it on a shelf, show it off to friends, and yet it just sits. I spoke of collecting earlier as an investment. A purchase should hopefully appreciate and value giving a beneficial return. In the case of video games, more often than not, they are wasted, like driving a brand new car off the lot. You won't make your full money back in the short term unless by some random circumstance, what you're holding onto becomes valuable enough to some middle-aged man who gets a tickle every time he sees Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time. Why he used that as an example, I don't know. In today's modern era marketplace, we could substitute that with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge, if you get the analogy, guys. What I've seen in recent years is the retro gaming market skyrocket, where nostalgia meets dollar signs. And I gotta say, that wasn't fully organic. Yes, video games are here to stay. Whenever I say it wasn't fully organic, a Timmy Kimmy or Poindexter comes out towards me from the comment section and says, Sean, Sean's saying nobody's going to collect video games. It's all artificial demand. That is not what I am saying. What I am saying, though, is to get the market to the point where we are at today in 2022, it was obviously manipulated. And if you're still on the other side of the fence, you don't see that. You do not understand how unregulated asset class markets work in general. So if you are investing in gold, silver, cryptocurrency, also other collectible asset classes, you are at a disadvantage because you're not realizing how easily it is to manipulate a lot of these markets and make prices pop. I've said this before. I'll say it again. A lot of you guys are at the mercy of market makers and market manipulators who you think are your friends or you think these are really ethical people that are just pulling you along. And guess what? They do not have your best interests at heart. Grading companies, auction companies, market makers, high profile collectors, they control these markets, not the little guy. I'm sorry to say that, guys. As much as that hurts you, that's never going to change because, again, these are unregulated markets. Going back to the article. 
Retro video games are going up in price and continue to do so with every passing year and passing hand. The prices of many retro video games continue to rise up like cream and tend to plateau at a certain point. That is 100% correct, guys. Go back to a lot of the videos that I've done in the past talking about great at WADA games and ridiculous prices being paid. Did some of those games I talked about still continue to go up in value? Yes. Is there a chance they're going to go up in value even more? Yes. Did some of them fall, though? Are there games out there that I covered where more came to market and now we're seeing them in auction after auction and the prices are starting to come down or at least plateau? The answer is yes. There are risks to these markets, guys. Please be aware of them. One such example is the Nintendo Entertainment System game Little Samson. Notorious for being highly sought after and valued at up to $2,300 as of this moment on price charting. I would never pay that much for a video game personally, but I do know many out there that salivate at the mouth for an opportunity to own it. As I continue to wonder why I have all this, I started to dig a little deeper. Now, we're getting into a very, very important point in this particular video, and I want you guys to really listen at these next two paragraphs because we're going to cover this in a separate topic, meaning there's going to be separate videos I'm going to be doing on this same talking point. I've mentioned before how I dislike the term gamer as if it's a class of people. However, when I stare at my collection, I refer to myself as a video game collector. I hang out in circles of other video game collectors where I've made friends and acquaintances and shared experiences with surrounding retro games. I've created a social identity and it's not an uncommon experience. So I started thinking about social identity theory. It's a social behavior determined by the character and motivations of the person as an individual, as well as by the person's group membership, i.e. intergroup behavior. This is why whenever I put out a video talking about the insanity of modern era Pokemon cards and the fact that they upped the print run to 9 billion cards, everybody in the Pokemon community flips out and they have to do a response to reserved investments because everybody in the Pokemon community needs to be calmed down and comforted with other people in that community that share their same beliefs. So if you're putting all your money in modern era Pokemon cards, that guy reserved investments is automatically wrong. He's incorrect in his analysis. And just keep doing what you're doing. We got your back. We're all correct. That Sean guy, he's wrong. This is why this particular YouTube channel is not designed and never will get to 100,000 subscribers. You know, I get in arguments or heated discussions with people all the time. Sean, you need to up your content. Sean, you could be one of the biggest YouTubers in the collectible space if you would put out like one or two videos a day and just go at it hardcore. And I keep telling people that will never happen because the people that receive the message that I put out about these markets don't want to hear it. You know where I trend the most according to the YouTube algorithm right now? I trend the most in the finance space. There's a lot of people that come to me and they reach out to me and they go, wow, Sean, your content is so stimulating. The way that you talk about alternate asset investing. And a lot of these guys, they're traditionalists. There's people that watch this channel that work for Goldman Sachs. There's a guy that reached out to me and he says he gets excited when he's at work and he gets the notification that there's a new reserved investments video. He works in the bond department. I don't want to identify him fully at Goldman Sachs and he makes close to $200,000, $300,000 a year and he loves my content. Him and two other guys literally on their lunch will watch my video on their smartphone before they have to go back to work in New York City. It's an incredible experience for me to hear that because it makes me proud because at least I'm reaching certain individuals. Now, obviously, those type of individuals are prone to agree with what I'm saying on this channel. Unfortunately, when the Pokemon crowd or the collectible card game crowd or the comic book crowd or the video game crowd or the vintage toy crowd, here's this commentary. What's their immediate reaction? We got to prove them wrong. He's 100% wrong. Shut reserved investments down. Let's get a video out there responding to reserved investments so everybody in our community can coalesce around us and say, you know what? Look, we responded to all the criticisms in that video. That guy reserved investments doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, I really hate to tell you, we got a problem. 
because I've been involved in these markets since the age of 12. And the mentors that taught me the antiques and collectibles trade from the inside out, when they died, they left behind net worse. The, my, my, my most experienced mentor who taught me a lot of the inside dynamics of the antiques and collectibles tra trade. When he died, he had a net worth valued at between five to $10 million. I had people that taught me sports cards. I had people that taught me glass. I had people that taught me cast iron collectibles. I had people that taught me coins, currency. Uh, what, what's the other one? Vintage advertising I was big into. And when those particular individuals died, the lowest person on the totem pole the person with the least amount of net worth who died was the guy that taught me vintage advertising and he had a net worth of $1.6 million and he was involved in these markets for many decades. So I am confident in what I teach in this particular channel because it's how I was taught to analyze these markets. And I, like a lot of my mentors, am also educated in business, economics, and finance, which is why I recommend a lot of the books I do on this particular YouTube channel. In addition to the teachings about antiques and collectibles. Going back to the article, it's pragmatic for me to say such a thing. However, I got to thinking if this social identity I created spurred my desire to collect video games. Surrounding yourself with like-minded people tends to have these effects. And I wondered if I collect because of that feeling of belonging or that I collect because I truly care about what I have. And again, this is another reason why I sometimes doubt. I wonder if he is a true 100% collector. I don't know. That's something that I can't answer. And again, that's my only question that I would ask the particular author of this piece. Has he always collected objects? Has he always been involved in the vintage video game space? Or is this something that he picked up along the way and just realized it wasn't for him? Because that does happen a lot as well, guys. Going back to the article, I shop around. I'm a stickler for a quality product. I have vanity in the way I display my collection. And I often talk about it with others like I'm some sort of paragon of video games. I follow YouTube personalities and Instagram influencers that match my persona. Let me repeat that again. I follow YouTube personalities and Instagram influencers that match my persona. So obviously, he's like... Some of these people out there in the Pokemon crowd, they hear a video from Reserved Investments. Ah, screw that guy. He's not one of us. He doesn't know what he's talking about. See what I mean, guys? It's, it's all related. It's all connected. This encourages me to go out and hunt for more, furthering this artificial identity. Deep down, I have a jealousy of what others have when I don't. I can only imagine this social identity is affecting others in more close-knit groups and collectives out there. The reason why I said earlier that was all a waste of money is that none of these video games are going anywhere. This is why I tell you guys when you come to me, antiques and collectibles are always going to be there, guys. I assure you, there are very few items that any of you out there own that you're not going to be able to get again. Now, when you get into some of these markets and you start paying like 40, 50, 100,000, quarter of a million, half a million dollars for one item, then you can argue that in most cases, you most likely will never come across that particular item again. Or if you do, you're going to most likely have to pay a pretty penny to get it. And that's why I tell you guys, I have people that come at me on this channel and they say, hey, Sean, you know, I was thinking of becoming a doctor. I was thinking of becoming a lawyer. Then I see channels like you, Rudy with Alpha Investments, SM Pratt. And I think, you know what? I want to get into antiques and collectibles. Guys, antiques and collectibles will always be here. Go and get your education Go and become something. Go get financially established. Then when you come back into these markets, I assure you, you're going to be in a better position to succeed. Going on with the article. These are valuable investments that are sitting on my shelf and I will never make a financial return on them because I refuse to sell them. And that's really it, guys. If you refuse to sell, you don't make any money on these items. These are speculative assets. When I invest in index funds, when I invest in stocks, when I invest in real estate to rent out, I get a cash flow out of that particular investment, even if, even if I just hold the investment. Meaning if I hold that stock, if I hold that index fund, if I hold that piece of real estate and I'm running it out, I'm getting cash flow. You can't do that with a collectible. You can't do that with cryptocurrency. You can't do that with a gold bar. You can't do that with a silver coin. 
You need to understand this. Back to the article. There are tons of collectors out there that collect video games like it's their job and resell them for profit. Pixel Game Squad, Chase After the Right Price, and Phoenix Resale, to name a few. And they're all great YouTubers. Um, I haven't really, I think Phoenix Resale, I did comment or interact with in the comment section once. I have not had any direct contact with Pixel Game Squad or Chase After the Right Price. Um, if you guys do maybe want to do a collaboration or you guys do want to converse with me, feel free to reach out. I'm very much open to it, assuming you like my content, assuming you like the, the vibe that I put out on this particular YouTube channel. They are wise investors because retro and nostalgia are very big money makers currently, requiring smart investing at not biting off more than you can chew. Unlike other investments that can be regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, video games don't seem to have a governing body that sets prices unless you count eBay as a governing body. And no, I would not use eBay as an example there. I think some of the more high profile auction sites outside of eBay would have been a better example to use in this case, especially with the allegations of market manipulation, especially when we talk about graded video games at present time. Nostalgia, rarity, and quality can drive up prices that are often determined by someone who feels personally connected to such products. Uh, so can market manipulators. Their personal connections to video games, including video game systems and accessories, can artificially inflate prices in an unregulated market. And if one wants it that bad, there's nothing that person can do but fork up the cash. Yes, you 100% understand unregulated markets and how they work. You see, I collect because of the nostalgia. Yes, it tickles me too. The video games on my shelf are mainly there for show, and I look fondly at those games that I had great experiences with. I don't use these games every day, and many have sat on my shelf for years, not being touched, much less played. That's why I collect and keep, because of the memories, and also because at some point, these games may be hard to come by. A rare experience in an impending all digital future we're heading towards. Okay, I gotta speak to this. I really have to speak to this. I disagree with the sentiment because even if we go to an all digital future, which we are slowly creeping towards, if you look at the adoption rate, there are people on the side of all digital that really, really only buy games in digital form. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the hardcore collectors, the hardcore video game connoisseurs that claim, hey, if we go to an all digital future, I'll no longer collect video games. Now, I don't think that's true because you're always gonna have companies like Limited Run Games putting out releases for systems maybe that are now defunct. Like I just saw they're releasing another version of Night Trap. This is like, I don't know how many different printings of Night Trap are gonna be on the market. This one's for PlayStation 5. So it's very interesting how we keep going back to the proverbial pump and putting out games that should already be dead. We keep bringing them back to life. Now, in my assessment, Night Trap is a great game. It was probably one of the first full motion video games that I've ever played back when I had my Sega CD hooked up, back when I bought it back in 1992 when it first premiered on store shelves. But I will tell you, that's pretty much going to be the norm going forward. Publishers like Limited Run, Strictly Limited Games... They're going to go back to the well and they're going to put out these now defunct classics and they're just going to release version after version of them to the point where a lot of you guys, you're going to get sick of them and a lot of these games are not going to be a good investment in that particular manner. Going back to the article, I may at some point want to pop in the original Resident Evil for the PlayStation and I'm thankful to have an opportunity at any given moment to do that. Um, I honestly think that Resident Evil for the PlayStation was a bad example in this scenario simply because there's better versions of Resident Evil. If you want to play it, you don't want to play the original PlayStation version. You can play the excellent remastered version that premiered on the Nintendo GameCube in physical form. There's also other ways to play that particular game. But he did hit the nail on the head, at least. He did state, hey, if I do get nostalgic towards this in a digital-only future, at least... If he owns a PlayStation, he has Resident Evil on the shelf, he can pop it in and play it at any given time. Continuing with the article, I've been collecting video games for years, and if I were to have jumped into the game at this point, I would be immensely dismayed at the prices. 100% agree with you. 
in my eyes, video games shouldn't rise in price because some dude has great memories playing games as a child. Whatever a game was worth on day one of its release, it should not rise in price any higher. Um, obviously, being in the antiques and collectibles trade, I fully disagree with that statement. Again, the antiques and collectibles trade, for the most part, is an unregulated market. People can get caught up in nostalgia. People can manipulate the market. People can attempt to make the market for this stuff. It all is relevant. You really can't control prices unless you put in place price controls. And nobody wants that to happen in the antiques and collectibles trade. And in most cases, it would serve no purpose. It's not like we're trying to control food allocation or the cost of an education or cost of health care or shelter house prices. These are not basic needs, guys. These are pretty much luxury collectibles, luxury assets, items that you don't need to sustain yourself day in and day out. Going back to the article, that of course is my personal feeling. However, it means little in the grand scheme of things. Retro video games are investments to many people, sadly. And for many, it's how they make their money, whether it be their main line of work or a side hustle. Collecting nostalgia can only be financially responsible if you intend to resell to break even or profit. Let me say that again. Collecting nostalgia can only be financially responsible if you intend to resell to break even or profit. This is why, going back to pop culture collectibles, every now and then, I have a Timmy that reaches out to me and says, Sean, I'm a genius. I bought Werewolf by Night. 32 in CGC 9.4, first appearance of Moon Knight, and I paid $3,000 for that comic book, and now it's up to $9,000, $10,000, $11,000. And I asked the person, well, aren't you going to sell into the market and take advantage of that profit margin? And they will say, no, Sean, I'm going to keep it for another 10, 20 years when I can sell it for forty, fifty, or $60,000. That's the way a lot of you guys think, and it is incorrect. There's no guarantee that particular item is going to exponentially continue to rise in value. Remember, guys, there is a financial concept that I've already taught in this channel called reversion to the mean. Somebody hit it, hit the nail perfectly on the head in one of the Facebook vintage comic book groups that I belong to that said, hey, it looks like prices for vintage comic books are starting to fall back down to where they were in 2015. And I agree with that assessment. I don't think all books are going to fall in value that hard, but I do see a retrace of a lot of price gains that were made during the pandemic. And a lot of you guys that didn't cash out and get your profit at that particular time, you're now going to be regretting it, especially if you paid, overpaid for a lot of these books by buying them at that particular time. Let's now finish the last two paragraphs of this particular well-written article. This thought gave me a sour feeling in my mouth as I walked away from my collection. These games serve no tangible purpose in my life other than looking pretty on a shelf. They aren't pieces of art in a museum that people can pay to see or gawk at. So why do I have all this? The question still eludes me, and I still question my motivations on why I purchase wasted products that do not produce anything tangible for me. Memories aren't in physical form after all. What do you think? Do you collect video games? Do you intend to resell or just keep them as trophies? And then he puts here, discuss in the comments or head over to his Discord. So this is a great article. I'm hoping that my analysis along with this article gave you something to think about. I know, I know, the Timmys, Kimmys, and Poindexters that watch this video and get triggered, they're gonna cut me up in the comment section and they're gonna claim that I am biased, that I have a bias against video games and video game collectors. I assure you guys, I love this stuff just as much as you. The difference is I can control my nostalgia, my feelings, and my emotions, and I understand finance, and I also understand how the antiques and collectibles trade works. Please consider joining me, subscribe to this channel, read my articles that I produce through Antiques and Auction News, and also, if you have any specific thoughts, comments, suggestions, feedback, please engage with me in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and have a great night.